Hi, everybody, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about starting an edible garden. Um, this is a, a topic that's very, very close to my heart, being a girl who grew up um, the daughter of German American immigrants and being able to grow through my entire childhood. I have a passion for edibles that cannot be taken away. It is just a part of my lifeblood and something I can't seem to stop doing is growing food. So I'm very happy to be here this morning and to share that passion with you. A little bit more about me. Uh, my name is Casey Eves. I'm the owner of Vivant Gardening Services and a garden leader at the Montrose Metro Community Garden here in Ravenswood. Um, I am also a German-American citizen. My family came to the United States in the 1850s and we settled in a German community in Southern Illinois um, where we had farms and I grew up growing carrots and washing them down on a driveway and eating them under my family's giant cherry tree. It was really lovely. Um, and now that I am in Chicago, I started growing food and suddenly everybody started asking me how to do it. Um, and that led me to becoming a personal gardener for some Michelin restaurateurs, for different restaurants, um, for a lot of homes as well. And I've continued in that same vein, encouraging people to be able to grow their own um, and also being a garden leader at the Montrose Metro Community Garden and getting a lot of people started with growing their edible gardens there. It's been a joy of my life. I am very happy that today I get to share it with you. So uh, before we get too deep into this, um, I know a few people are still catching up because we had that earlier kind of false start. Um, but I want to hear from you as you're tuning in. Tell me if you are growing in a raised bed, in a container, or in an in-ground situation. Um, so that way we can see how we're going to be talking through this as we go. Talking about where you're growing um, will tell you a lot about your plant's house, right? Soil is an essential need of a plant, and that plant that, that soil becomes the home for your plant to live in and provides it with nutrient and sa nutrients and safety through all the storms, like the ones that we just had this past week. So determining how you're going to grow is going to impact a lot about this, the plant health that you have over the course of the year. So we're going to talk through raised beds, containers, and in-ground. If you are fortunate enough to be able to grow in-ground in your backyard, that is wonderful. It's one of the top environments that you can give to a plant. Um, in-ground soil has microbes in it. It has trace nutrients in it. It's got a lot more going on and a whole microcosm of organisms that are there to support your plant. The only issue with that, especially in Chicago, is that we have high concentration of lead in our soil, as well as a few other heavy metals. So if you haven't had a soil test done on the soil in your backyard, I don't recommend throwing your first edible seeds directly into the ground. I recommend that you go ahead and pay a little bit. It's not too expensive um, in order to get that test done. The Cook County Farm Bureau, as well as the University of Illinois Extension Office has listings of all the labs available in order for you to have a soil test done. That's why you see a lot of people in Chicago growing in raised beds or in containers. So let's talk a little bit more about those. A container garden is exactly what it sounds like, right? You are, you are taking advantage of whatever space you have, be it your apartment balcony, your condo balcony, a brick paved patio, or even concrete slabs that might be on the back of your property and putting containers on it to grow your plants in. Container gardens have benefits. They're very versatile. They're lightweight. You can move stuff around um, in a way that you can't do if you're planting in the ground, but it does have some drawbacks as well. The biggest of that is that you are limiting the amount of soil the amount of water and the amount of nutrients that your plants get, right? If you think about it, a plant in the ground can access in any direction all the nutrients that it wants going back and forth. It can take tap roots really deep down. In a container, it's locked into this environment. So your plant is only gonna have what you put into it. So it does take more water on your part as a human <laughs> to give to it. Um, and you do need to think about making sure that your plants are gonna have a decent amount of food However, um, because you are growing with potting soil and things like that that are more sterilized before they go in the ground, you are a little bit less susceptible to some of the pests that could easily find your garden the first year in the soil, and you're not going to have as much weeding to do. Um, also, a benefit is that you're going to end up with a little bit more of an ergonomic garden, right, because you can lift those containers up really easily. 
If you're growing in containers, my only recommendation to you when you're starting out is to buy larger containers, um, especially if you're hoping for peppers and tomatoes and fruiting crops. Those need a minimum of 12 inches of soil um, in order to get their roots down and access everything they need. So look for a planting depth of 12 to 18 inches if you can do it and the same across. It's gonna save you a lot in your time needing to water it. Um, smaller pots that are six to eight inches sometimes need to be watered twice a day. And that can be a drag in August when you're trying to do a lot of the fun things that are happening in the city. So go big on your containers from the get-go and, and you will enjoy a much, a much happier garden. And then last, we're going to talk about raised beds. This is by far the most popular growing method in Chicago. Um, I honestly think that it is a great growing method as well. Raised beds take an upfront investment. There's no doubt about it. And you definitely get exactly what you paid for, right? Um, if anybody has tried to set up a raised bed already, uh, you, will, you will know this. As you as you work with your bed, if you order something for under $100, um, you're essentially going to see it decay uh, from the time you take it out of the box and try to set it up through the second year. Uh, there are a lot of companies even that will say that they have really high quality cedar beds for under $100. But then when you get them out, you'll see the corners are only this thick and one Chicago winter is enough for them to start splitting. So if you are going for a raised bed and you just want to try it for one year this year, go ahead, buy something cheap, try it out. Um, but if you are hoping to put something in more permanently, go, go bigger on your investment. It's going to be worthwhile um, and get something that's at least an inch thick in its boards, um, not pine, something like cedar or dug fir or, or anything hardier than that. Um, and, and allow yourself to have that extra benefit. Um, it's going <laughs> to going to do a lot for you. The same goes for your soil. You can you can be pretty cheap with your soil, right? You can buy it, you know, when it goes on sale at Home Depot for like $1.99. But at the same time, you're going to want to incorporate a little bit more nutrient level into that. So if you buy cheap soil, you're going to want to buy good compost to mix in. Um, you can't rely on fertilizer in the long run to keep up everything that your plant needs. The, the plants are used to having a full ecosystem. And if you take that down to just the basic, basic ingredients, you're going to see some, some suffering in your plant nutrients over time. So go ahead, make sure at least the top like four inches of your soil is really, really high quality. Um, and that will help push nutrients down over the rest of the year. I hope that's helpful. Um, if Again, if you are growing in raised beds, I want to hear from you. Uh, type it into the comment below. If you're growing in containers, do the comment below as well for that. Um, and also let me know if you're growing in ground. If for any reason you are tuning in because you want to learn how to start an edible garden and you don't know which one you're going to do, I want to hear that as well. It's going to be great. Um, another thing as we move forward, if you hear something you already knew, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Um, if you hear something that you absolutely love the idea of and can't wait to get started, give me a heart. And if for some reason I blow your mind today, just go ahead and give me a wow face so that I can see how that's going. So we've talked about the basics of starting an edible garden in terms of where you're going to grow. Um, raised beds and containers take a little bit less time because you don't have as many native weeds popping up. Uh, but soil pays off in nutrients in the long run if you're growing in ground. You also want to pay attention with the dirt that you're putting in those raised beds as to the, the lightness of that soil, right? Here in Chicago, we, we make bricks with our clay. It's very strong. And so you try to sink a shovel in there and sometimes it just kind of bounces off the surface. Um, and that is the benefit of, of, of brick making, but it is also pretty terrible in terms of how much we've compacted our soil over time. So you wanna make sure that your soil has a lot of what we call porosity to it, because the air that your plants need um, is not just above ground. It's not just them breathing like you and I do out of the top of our bodies, um, but they also need it in their roots in order to promote good root development and to allow them to get through the soil faster. So make sure that you're choosing something that's lightweight. Um, look for things that might have choir, peat moss, or at least a lot of what we call organic humus in it or humus in it. Um, this is going, or compost basically. This is gonna create the air pockets that your roots need below. All right, we're gonna talk through just a few more basic needs of plants. And then I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about seeds and all of that. Um, your garden is gonna need some sun. 
And sun is a hot commodity in Chicago, right? It's also one that cannot be replaced. This is a natural resource that you, you just can't fake it. <laughs> it's not going to work over the course of the season. So keep an eye out in your yard for the sunny spots um, in order to know where you might be able to put a garden. If you are looking at getting one started and you don't know where your sunny spots are, maybe a container garden is the best way to get going because then you can plant in that container and move it around your property seeking those sunny spots. And if it's not doing well in one spot, you can just wheel it over to another. Um, so that's a nice way to get started with it. You can also take any kind of cheap mailings that come in, in the mail or construction paper and set it out with like a brick on top of it in different parts of the yard. And you're gonna see how much it fades right over the course of a week. That fading would be caused by UV rays. So you would be able to know which portion of the yard is getting the most sun based off of which one has the biggest difference between the paper under your brick and the one that was exposed to sunlight. So that's gonna help you out. Things that are short um, and non-fruiting like leafy greens or herbs um, with the exception of basils. Uh, they, especially woody herbs, which is what we call rosemary, thyme, oregano, right? Those kinds of pieces, they tend to really do well even in part sun. You can have four to six hours of sun and you can have a salad garden and a basic herb garden. This is a big comfort to a lot of our balcony growers because you just don't have a lot of choices there. But if you want to get tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, anything, anything that has that kind of fruiting nature to it, where it puts out a flower and then develops a fruit on it that you pick off of a vine, those you are going to need six to eight hours of sun in the minimum. Um, so that's that's a lot of daylight, right? We need we need as much of it as we can get. So keep an a lookout in your yard for that in order to help you maximize your garden and understand the type of garden you can have. If you just have a shady yard, then you're just gonna be a salad grower. And that's not a problem because we eat a lot of salads and leafy greens. They're so healthy for you. You should be taking advantage of that. If for some reason you have an absolute boon of sunlight in your backyard, then go ahead and be a salsa gardener and go crazy. Um, and you'll be able to enjoy that. But just know that that is really, really precious. So if you have an area of your yard that has the sun, prioritize that towards your edibles, you can always find perennial plants and native plants that can go in any other portion of your yard. All right, the other thing that a basic plant needs, right, in order to survive is water. So make sure as you're setting up your edible garden that you have a water plan, whether that is, I know where my hose hookup is and the hose is gonna go here, so it's not going to knock anything off of a table, or it's not gonna push up against a chair or another plant in my yard and bend it over. You wanna make sure that it's gonna have a clear path to the garden um, or maybe a rain barrel, or maybe you're just going to carry it over in a watering can and water it. But if you don't put that water plan together at the beginning of the season, you could find yourself really frustrated with what you've put into place. So make sure that that path is gonna be easy enough. Keep in mind a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So if you have if you have a three gallon container or a five gallon container in some cases, that's a decent amount of pounds that you're carrying across the yard. So making that path to water as short as possible in your edible garden is gonna be a big benefit. A lot of people for this reason, put their herbs and their leafy greens as close as they can to their kitchen um, because they can get the water out there quickly and it works out really well. And then the harvest doesn't have to travel too far to get back to their kitchen. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, and also as you're planning an edible garden, there are so many varieties of vegetables and foods that are out there. And it can get really exciting to think about all the capabilities of these bizarre vegetables, right? Um, you can see yourself going towards sour melons and you can try to grow like a weird dragon fruit tree in your backyard. But in reality, you're gonna get the best bang for your buck and the most satisfaction out of the things that you know you already enjoy eating. You're gonna find those flavors enhanced by growing them at home and you'll get more nutrition out of them but rather than trying to like force your family to eat a bunch of weird vegetables just because you wanted to try to grow them out throw a couple in for kicks try something but keep in mind that a majority of the things that you grow you're gonna want to eat so make sure that you incorporate that into the mix if your family loves spinach get it going um, if your family loves you know if you but if you want to try okra right and your family has absolutely no experience with okra whatsoever then i wouldn't necessarily put in 15 okra plants make sense great and then the last thing that your garden is really going to need is love it's going to need a lot of love 
Um, plants don't need to be talked to or sung to as much as some weird plant nerds might tell you, but they do need your attention. And this is because you just don't know what's happening in your growing world for many years. Um, it takes about three years to get situated with a garden and really understand its seasons and how things change. And so making sure that you just take some time and have some quality time with your garden is really important. A lot of people find that they will water in the morning and take out a cup of coffee with them and stare at their plants um, just to get a sense of the health, see where the weeds are popping up. But it also helps you to catch things like aphid infestations or other garden pests really early, where if you only visit your garden once a week to week and a half in order to water it, you might have some things creep up on you that you didn't necessarily anticipate coming. And by the time you find it, you'll think it's devastating, which is so terrible to have that feeling. So by, by looking at it over the course of the week, you can catch things early. Just go, go visit. It doesn't take much. It takes a minute um, and you'll enjoy it, which will be fun. Great. The more, the more that you watch your garden grow, also the more confident you're going to become as a gardener, the, the more proud you're going to be of these plants that you're raising. So take the time and enjoy it. I want to talk to you a little bit as well about getting things started from seed, right? We have a lot of new gardeners in Chicago right now, or a lot of people who want to be gardeners right now in Chicago. Um, people are trapped inside and they want to grow. And because of that, our seed houses in the United States have been really overwhelmed with orders. Um, within the first week after the announcement of the shelter in place order, Johnny Select Seeds in Maine saw a 400% increase in sales. They got a month of sales in a week and then it continued. They actually had to shut for a while and say, we need to get seeds to the farmers before we can get them to the home growers. Hold off on your orders. We'll pick back up in a little bit because they were just overrun. The same thing is happening to perennial houses and it's happening to garden supply stores. So if you have trouble finding seeds on the first take, please don't be discouraged by it. These seed houses are reopening. They are going to get them to you. Hardware stores are still open and functioning and so are nurseries. So you will always have a way to get a plant. It just may not be in seed form. It may be in another form. So just be flexible with it this season as we go and share the enthusiasm with people that you see in your life who are starting their gardens for the first time. With that said, I wanna go through a little bit of what you definitely can grow from seed when you're starting an edible garden versus what you should be buying as a plant because it's really gonna help you get started right now. A lot of things um, can be started from seed. In fact, most things can be started from seed. Your big exceptions right now, and I'll say them nice and slow so that you can write them down as needed, are tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, stand with me, tomatillos, Brussels sprouts. Those are your big ones. I'm going to say them one more time. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, tomatillos, Brussels sprouts. These are very long season crops. They take a minimum of about three months of growth in order for you to get to a spot that you're going to see harvest happening from them. Tomatillos, slightly shorter, but not by much. And so starting them from seed at this point of the season in Chicago is gonna be a bit of a stretch. We are at May 2nd. By this time, those, those plants should have been about, you know, three, three to four inches tall. And so you really, if you haven't gotten them started by now, you're gonna to wanna to buy those plants. Just about everything else you can grow from seed at this point. You can grow carrots, greens, beans, cucumbers, squashes, all of those can grow from seed. And I really encourage you to do them from seed because they're also ones that can face a little bit of shell shock in the transplant. So by having seed for them, even if you buy some plants, you still have an insurance policy. Now you can put in, you can buy lettuce starts right now if you want to get something really early out of your garden to plant. You'd plant your lettuce and then you'd sprinkle seeds around it. And that would be what we call succession sowing. So you'd get this harvest now and the seeds would come up later, which is really helpful. Um, you can't do that with the tomatoes and the peppers and things, but it is something that you can consider at this point. You can also not space out your plants as much as they say on a seed packet, because keep in mind of the seed packets that are out there, 
that spacing is recommended for a farmer, right? The spacing on a radish packet or a carrot packet is put in place so that people can plant an entire field row of them and not come back until harvest time or weeding time. You, as a city gardener in a smaller environment and a more compact environment, you're going to be visiting your garden on a more regular basis and you're going to be sneaking little tastes as you go. And so you're going to be creating the airflow between your plants as you do that and you don't have to worry about the spacing as much. Um, just keep in mind that if it's a root crop, you leave enough space for the root to grow to the size you want it to be. So if you're growing a carrot, you are going to need to have a carrot's distance of space in between those plants. But otherwise, you don't need to spread them out quite as much. I also want to show you some things about planting your seeds. So I have, these are pelleted carrot seeds. And what this means is sometimes your seeds are so small that you can't even see them. Um, this is a carrot seed that basically has a small plaster surround on it, right? That'll break down over rain and will allow you to hold them easier in your hand so that you can put one down and one down and one down in your row. So when you see pelleted seeds, it's not all chemicals, it's that. Um, but there's also things like radish seeds. I'm gonna pull some of those out for you as well. Radish seeds are some of the first things to grow. If you need a confidence boost, a radish seed will do it. And you're barely going to be able to see this in my fingers. Look at how little it is. It's so tiny. Um, so I want to give you a sense of those different pieces. And then I'm going to show you just like what a regular bean seed would look like so that you have a concept of that as well. Bean seeds are much larger. In fact, they look very similar to a Tic Tac, right? Um, when you are doing your planting, you are going to be planting your seeds, and this is universally true, which is fantastic. It's nice to have this. Um, you plant your seeds to three times deep as they are size and seed. So if your seed is the, the size of a Tic Tac, like your bean seed, you're going to plant it three Tic Tacs deep. Does that make sense? If you're going to be planting your radish seed, which is pretty tiny, you're going to be planting it like a little pencil tip deep, right? Because it's three times the size of the seed that you're planting. And again, that is universal. That works even for marigolds. Marigolds like to be planted three marigold seeds deep. Sunflowers the same, squash the same, all of them the same. Now, the exception, of course, that you run into is sometimes your seeds are so tiny, like those radish seeds or even lettuce seeds, which are even smaller, that you are like, how am I supposed to measure that at all, right? In those, what I end up doing is brushing back just a very small, thin layer of the topsoil and loosening it with my fingertips. I sprinkle the seeds on top of that and then pat them down just like I'm patting somebody on the top of the head. Um, and that will help sure that those seeds make contact with soil because they can stay on that surface that will still be three lettuce seeds deep. I hope that's helpful. Um, if you are, again, looking for plants, and looking for seeds, all of our garden centers have just been reopened, which is lovely. Keep in mind, many of them are offering free delivery services um, or delivery services after a certain purchase. So you can keep that in mind as well. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to be taking them here soon. I just want to give you a couple other quick uh, pieces so that we can pull it all together for you. We talked about whether or not you grow in containers, raised beds, or in the ground. All of them work as long as your soil was tested if you're doing in the ground to make sure that there's no heavy concentrations of lead. Um, but otherwise, they all work. Give your plants a minimum planting depth of 12 inches. So try not to buy containers that are smaller than 12 inches wide or deep because you're going to need those nutrients. And keep in mind that if you grow in containers, you're going to want to fertilize a little bit more. You can do that with putting compost on top. A liquid uh, fish fertilizer or seaweed fertilizer works really well. I love Neptune's Harvest for this. Um, it's really great. Again, that's Neptune's Harvest. Um, so you'll continue that. And then over the course of the season, once you start to see flowers on your fruiting plants, like your beans and your tomatoes, you fertilize or add more compost at that time as well. Right now in Chicago, this is so exciting. Our nighttime temperatures are around 40 degrees. That's an exciting thing. Um, go figure. Um, once we get above 50 degrees at nighttime temperatures, that's when you can plant your big fruiting plants. So that includes your beans, that includes your cucumbers and squash from seed, that includes your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, all of those pieces. 
all of the green leafy things that you can put in your yard, right? Or root crops. So beets, turnips, radishes, carrots for root crops, as well as all forms of lettuces, herbs, spinach, Swiss chard, bok choy, celery, onions, all of those things, they can be planted right now. That's what we call a cool season crop. It can be planted when your soil temperatures are above freezing. So again, I'm gonna say it one more time. Your cool season crops include green leafy things and herbs, right, um, in general saying, and then your hot season crops are things that will have fruit on them. Now you'll find that basil can be a little temperamental right now, but it will recover <laughs> if you were to plant it a little too early. And if for some reason you plant something and it feels like it's shocking out a little bit because transplant shock is real, you could just put a milk jug or something next to it or on top of it um, in order to help insulate it a little bit from the winds that we have at this moment. Um, in general, your edible garden is going to need about an inch of rain a week. We got that this week. So all set on planting there. Um, if you are wondering what an inch of rain looks like, go ahead and take a little tuna can saved from your pantry, empty it out, clean it, of course, and set it in your garden. It's an inch deep and it will help you measure the rainfall. So you can go and take a look at the tuna can and go, oh, we got an inch of rain, we're good, I don't need to water. Or you'll be able to see, mm, I should give it a little bit this week. This takes you through everything that your plants need. It also takes you through what you can grow um, from seed as well as from a plant. I can't tell you enough um, how exciting it is to know that the world is going to have more gardeners in it this year and that you're using this shelter and home to grow your edible plants. It is so exciting for somebody who has loved this her whole life to know that other people are going to learn to love it this year. I've also started a special promotion this year that I wanted to tell you about with City Grange, which is one of our local garden centers. Um, I, am, I have a discount for their raised bed kits for this year. They deliver the raised bed constructed and all the dirt to fill it. And it's actually done at a really affordable price. Um, dirt can be expensive um, if you're cultivating a really good soil and trying to put a mix together. And they have incorporated it all into a price that in a lot of cases would be the cost of the wood itself. So I highly recommend for ordering from City Grange, and I will have a promo code on the Vivant page in order to help you with that raised bed order. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that we are starting a subscription series. So if you are interested in learning more about edible gardens, let's say you listened to this and you went, wow, there's so much I don't know. I feel a little overwhelmed. I mean, I'm going to write down a whole bunch of notes and watch this video three times, but I need I need some more information and some confidence along the way. Um, we're doing the Teach Me to Garden subscription series, which is available at vivantgardens.com. It's $100 for the season, which is the lowest that I can possibly produce it for. And I'm doing it at that rate because I want people to not be discouraged this year in their first gardens. Um, if you buy the subscription, what will happen is every week you'll get a very short, much shorter than today, um, instructional video of what to plant that week or what to do that week. I'll even walk you through the starting of your containers or your raised beds. And I will stay with you all the way through the first frost so that you can do everything in small 10 minute increments increments over the course of the season and gain confidence along the way. This will be for Chicago gardeners, so I will be able to tell you when the pests are showing up in this area, when to fertilize, all of those pieces, and we'll also have a private Facebook group with me so that you can send me pictures and you can ask all the questions that you need to over the course of the season. This is really exciting. This is something that is not usually available in our area, um, and I cannot wait to be able to help more people get confident with their first growing. So that is the Teach Me to Garden series, and it's going to be at vivantgardens.com. I will also have a promo code for everybody who buys that for their raised beds at City Grange, which we're really excited to partner with. More local partners partnerships, right? Domkaus, Vivant, City Grange, Montrose Metro Community Garden, we're all getting along. Great. Um, the last thing that I want to tell you is that this is going to be the last from my apartment uh, teaching series for the Donkhouse Gardening mini series. Next week, instead of having a video, you're going to see a Facebook poll go up on the Donkhouse page because it's going to be time to plant the rooftop terrace at Donkhouse. We're going to be doing all of the um, planters that go along the roof line there in the event space so that when we are ready to go back out again and enjoy all of the wonderful things that Donkhouse does, we're able to have a beautiful space in which to do it. Um, 
That planting is going to happen on May 14th. Next week, we're going to submit three designs for the planters, and we're going to allow you to vote and choose them. Um, and then in addition to that, we're asking that you throw an extra couple of dollars into your donation to Doghouse this week in order to help cover the cost of those plants so that we can maintain this pillar of the community in the best way possible. So again, May 14th will be the planting date. We will do the entire roof terrace planter uh, planting with all of the beautiful annuals that we're putting in on, live on Facebook on May 14th. You can follow along and learn how to do your home containers by watching us do them there. And then next week, keep an eye on the Donkhouse page for the donation link, as well as for the chance to vote on what this year's Donkhouse planting scheme should look like. I have had a wonderful time talking with you these past three weeks from home on Saturday mornings and helping you through your home landscape, through thinking about the edible perennials that you can incorporate into it and how to care for it this spring, and now talking to you about some of my favorite things, growing an edible garden. I hope that you will stay with us and consider the Teach Me to Garden series for the year, and I look forward to seeing you all again online on May 14th.